it is true. I just sort of showed up at the place that he was at in Kyoto. Uh, but it was, I thought, a kind of a Buddhist way of doing things. And so, uh, Part of what uh, I wanted to show you was this shovel. This is a shovel from our farm. Uh, and it represents, in many ways, the symbol of Earth Day uh, for our family. Uh, this shovel, at one point, had a point. Uh, and of course, how do you get rid of the point? You slowly wear it down over the years. And literally, my grandparents wore this down. Uh, my parents had this shovel and wore it down. And now it's mine, and my duty is to wear it down. But I don't know if I work that hard, so maybe I'm not going to wear it down quite as much as they did. But it's a perfect example of Earth Day and how that brings together a sense of history, family, and the land, too. So we're going to start with this uh, short DVD uh, from a documentary film that's been made about our farm. Uh, and hopefully you'll start uh, whenever you're ready. My grandmother and grandfather that I farm. He told my grandmother, my grandmother was furious. She goes, you bought a farm? You buy things in America? That's wrong because they take things away from you in America. And she was absolutely right. And she had witnessed this happen with her own personal life. So she refused to go. My dad said, look, we're going to the farm tonight. And she said, no, I'm not going. This is a documentary that was made about our farm, and specifically it's about uh, uh, the succession of our, our daughter who's taking over the farm, too, and the dynamics of generations on the land. Uh, this film premiered uh, a couple weeks ago in San Francisco in the Bay Area. It'll be shown at the end of this month at the Japanese American National Museum in LA, uh, and it's scheduled to be aired nationally on PBS in May of 2016. Uh, so those are some of the uh, thoughts with it. But the wonderful thing for us is I think it, it sort of it tells the story, the backstory of food, farming, and especially today on Earth Day, to sort of uh, acknowledge in that notion of resilience and change that's occurred, that occurs, and how we all adapt to it. And that theme of uh, resilience is something that uh, often I write about, uh, and especially today uh, as we celebrate and commem commemorate Earth Day, I think it, it involves this notion of generations on the land and how they cope with things. And this is a letter from one of my books called Heirlooms called Leaving Behind Stories, and it's a very short passage. Dear children, when I die, what will I leave behind for you? The things I cherish are stories and memories, rich in details, authentic emotions, memories alive and embedded in a story. That's how I hope to leave my legacy. And what will forever be part of my story? The land. The farm isn't full of huge profits, and as I've grown older, I realize it's not success that I leave behind, rather it's significance. And I think it's significance that marks uh, Earth Day and our whole notion and connection with ecology and also with the environment, too. Uh, when we farm organically, there's basically three ideas that we try to live with. And sometimes they call them the triple bottom line. Organic farming is about people, place, and profits. Another way of describing it was uh, organic farming is environmentally responsible, socially just and economically viable. And those are the three uh, legs of the stool, three things we try to do to maintain our operations and learn to live with nature and human nature on the farm. Uh, of course, in many ways, uh, that it's not farming in the abstract. 
we farm real land and real places. Uh, and I'll describe from Epitaph for Peach uh, one of the challenges that we have. I used to have armies of weeds on my farm. They launched their annual assault with the first warm weather of spring, parachuting seeds behind enemy lines and poking up in scattered clumps around in the fields. But now I have very few weeds. I removed them in a single day. Uh, I didn't even break into a sweat. I simply redefined what I called a weed. <laughs> A turning point came when a friend started calling his weeds natural grasses. I liked that term. It didn't sound as evil as weeds. It had a soft, gentle tone about it. So I came to think of my weeds as part of nat a natural system at work on my farm, part of allowing nature to take over our land. And in many ways, it was that uh, ability to let go the ability to acknowledge that I don't control things on the farm, that was a turning point in our operation. And it gave me this perspective where I could see uh, myself, our family, as part of this land in cooperation, in conjunction with it, as opposed to trying to control and dominate with it. And I think certainly Earth Day and as Buddhists, we honor, celebrate, and commemorate that kind of relationship, that partnership with, that we have with the land. And in many ways, uh, uh, that partnership has a certain human quality about it. I think sometimes when you look at the ecological movement, they tend to think of nature as being something that hu us humans don't interact with. And as a farmer, of course, I interact all the time with, our, with, our, with nature in the farm. But I like to think that in many ways we leave uh, our fingerprints on nature. And here's a passage from another book I wrote called Wisdom of the Last Farmer. And it talks about something very common on all good farms. Like all good farms, we have a junk pile. It comes with the farm and a succession of owners. Each farmer and generation contributes to the collection of odd machine parts, old equipment, and discarded history. The pile stays put, planted, as if part of the landscape growing with each decade. No one plans to grow a junk pile, but one naturally evolves with farmers and their history. After I spoke at a farm conference, an old farmer once came up to me to tell me about his pile. Out here, we don't call them junk piles, he said. And I thought he was going to use the term bone pile, which I've heard before in the past. Instead, he, called, he said, and he leaned over very close to me as if to whisper a secret, here we call our junk piles inventory. <laughs> And I really like that sensibility about the relationship that we have with places. Uh, it's, it involves that notion that we are part of nature, and, actually, and at the same time, we contribute and have, uh, we, there's consequences to what we do with nature, too. The art junk pile does grow. Uh, my wife always rolls her eyes every year because I keep adding to this junk pile, <laughs> claiming I'm going to use everything at one point in my life. Of course, I won't. Uh, but it's healthy, I think, uh, to do that. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, 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 to me, it's part of that sense of uh, Buddhism and impermanence that uh, I will one day leave this junk pile, but it will stay forever, at least in my lifetime, too. Uh, on this Earth Day, I also uh, want to make sure I talk a little bit about the drought that we're all facing in many different ways. Uh, I, uh, am, I just finished, I also write a column for the Fresno Bee and the Sacramento Bee, and I just finished one, and it should be uh, published uh, toward the end of this month. And it talks about how do we tell the story of the drought 
The story of the drought really started years ago, especially out on our farms, because I think we felt it with cutbacks, with obviously no water uh, for surface water uh, that comes from snow melt, a declining amount with it. And now, of course, everyone in urban areas are now impacted by the drought in many ways. The question is, how is this drought framed as a story? And as a writer, I was intrigued by it, because right now there's a lot of drama that's told about the drought. One of the challenges when you tell the story of a drama, it quickly evolves into the story of a tragedy. And tragedies are often limited because we are, it's driven by fear. I like to think of it as the drought is really part of that mystery of nature. We do not know if it's gonna rain next year. We don't know if this is a five, six, or 20 year drought. It's part of that mystery and mysteries the art, it's not a matter of having a tragedy involved that we're driven by fear, but rather it's about a story of trying to understand and live with that unsolved mystery. And that's how I think we're trying to focus on, on the drought as much. The drought is, of course, all about location and geography. Our farm belongs to a watershed of the King's River. The Kings River is unique because it never ran and connected with the ocean. So it changes all the dynamics of water politics and water policy. Our farm sits on a good supply of groundwater, that is the aquifers underneath it. We will quickly, as this drought continues, begin to understand where in the state are good groundwater supplies and where aren't. It's this new map of water that is being uh, discovered now because very, most of us have very little understanding of where all those aquifers are. Example, our farm, our water table is around 60 to 70 feet, which is very, very good. If you go 20 miles west of our farm, it drops down to 500 to 1,000 feet. If you go further south, another 20 to 50 miles, same thing. It drops down to like six, seven, eight hundred feet. And those wells, those farmers are trying to uh, drill wells that go that far down. It's very expensive. It's expensive to pump water up from that distance. And also the quality of the water often isn't very good. So there's those dynamics about this invisible landscape of aquifers that's going to really start being the new map of California. Uh, in many ways, uh, when you look at uh, the map, that kind of map of California and begin to understand some of the dynamics, you, under, you begin to grasp the idea of things that we don't control. And that's part of that theme of uh, the mystery of the drought and the mystery of life. Uh, which I think in many ways is part of this essence of Buddhism too. Learning to live with a mystery, life is not a problem to be solved. Uh, farmers often have their own kind of quirky way of dealing with some of these things. Um, there was uh, a hailstorm many years ago that came through our valley right at the peak of harvest and it hailed on our peaches. Uh, and uh, we lost probably about 80% of the crop in that one hailstorm. So us farmers were talking to each other, and uh, one of the farmers told me this kind of twisted humor that farmers have, and he said that uh, uh, when, uh, and, he, and so I wrote a passage about this in a book called Harvest Sun. Following a disaster like a storm, uh, that destroys a year's work, a joke started circulating in the community, farm to farm, farmer to farmer. Like good humor, it makes all of us smile even just a little as we grapple with the grief uh, from the storm. And the story goes like this. They did an autopsy of an old farmer, and when they opened him up, they found he was full of next year's. And in many ways, that's what farming and what we do, we're always thinking about next year with the idea that it might be better or really the idea that there will be change in this coming years and we want to accept that kind of change that unfolds. Uh, one of the other ways I, as both a farmer and also a writer, I try to look at the real world 
of farming and the environment that we live in. And again, it's not trying to farm a pristine nature as if I never have impact on it. I try to work in partnership with that nature. But also it involves uh, the different types of farming that we've done. I wrote an essay once called When uh, Tractors Replaced Horses. And if you look at the uh, evolution of tractors on a farm, they began in the early 1900s by Henry Ford who developed this uh, tractor. And it's a perfect economic curve where tractors were introduced in the early 1900s and like a straight line began to replace horses. And at the same time, horses, which were the dominant form on all farms, had a gradual decline. And the crossing point was right after World War II, around 1948, uh, there were suddenly more tractors on a farm than horses. And one of the uh, quotes that I've read that supposedly Henry Ford said that, uh, and it talks about the notion of change and how we accept change or have difficulty with change. And he said, ask a farmer what they want. And he was complaining that they, farmers are so resistant to tractors. He said, ask a farmer what, uh, what they want and they'll tell you all they want is a faster horse. And it's this idea that there's this dynamic of change that evolves and the, and the type of thinking coping with that change. Well, I like to think of uh, tractors on our farm uh, as part of this ever evolving nature, but it also connects with the past. And growing up a Buddhist, uh, I wrote this passage that talks about the sounds of nature and about our tractors. I own a Buddhist tractor. When it's running well, I can hear the um of a finely tuned engine and the potential for great work. I believe that in the past, most farmers connected spiritual beliefs with farm sounds. But many of those spiritual farm sounds are lost in today's modern farming. I have never heard a folk song about planting, harvest, or change of season in California. I have no chant to bless a new tractor or a plow, although in Fresno, the Armenians have a delightful blessing of the grapes. I cheat and go to their celebration, hoping the good luck will rub off. Uh, but few farmers talk to their vines or trees anymore. Farming in California is over 100 years old. Perhaps that's not enough time for folk cultures to adapt to the change. Today, we seem to have less spiritual work and we end up doing mostly business. But that's precisely why I hear a Buddhist chant from my tractor and the sound of a um as it runs through my fields. And that is partly the uh, sense of the senses that we try to do on our farm and understand the dynamics of learning to live and work with nature. And again, work with nature in those three different ways, environmentally responsible, socially just, and also economically viable. Because in many ways, that triple bottom line, as uh, many farmers, organic and sustainable farmers, will talk about uh, is what our goal is, especially as we commemorate and celebrate Earth Week and Earth Day this year. Uh, let me close with this one final passage. In the work that we do on our farm, I think we try to look at this whole cycle of life. And in that sense, I think it's very Buddhist. Uh, so here's a passage from Epitaph for a Peach that I'd like to close today with. I feel like many of the old farmers who don't know when or how to retire. They're not good at endings. My destiny is to work the land and leave behind a farm. Grow peaches is all part of my lifelong quest. <clears throat> now I know why old farmers keep hanging up. Excuse me. Keep hanging on. They greet each season anew and maintain a passion for their work. They rise early, anxious to start each day. They understand that it's the journey that's important and not the end. Thank you for letting me share my stories with you today. Thank you.